Okay, so uh, as I said, I'm Alan Evans. I'm head of marine policy at the National Oceanography Centre in the UK. Uh, and I've spent a fair share of my last 20 years uh, either applying policy or contributing to its drafting. Uh, with regards to applying policy, this has been focused uh, mainly on the UK's obligations under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, uh, UNCLOS, uh, in particular defining areas of continental shelf beyond 200 nautical miles, um, the application of undertaking marine scientific research, so this could be uh, ensuring that our research vessels have the appropriate diplomatic clearance for undertaking marine scientific re, uh, research in your waters in some instances. Uh, and also in enabling the transfer of marine technology. And that in no small part in the recent few years has been enabled through uh, official development assistance funding. And, and such funding is supporting the delivery of this workshop as well. Uh, and transfer of marine technology is not only about providing technology, the, the toys and the gadgets, but it's also about knowledge exchange and, and, and sharing such experiences. More broadly, I've been involved in supporting other countries in delivering activities that support their ocean governance ambitions, such as defining their maritime boundaries with neighbouring states, or bringing attention to other countries what marine scientific research data already exists in their marine estates. And an understanding of what already exists, of course, enables them to better understand what's available to understand the condition of the marine environment, which then leads to them uh, enabling them to govern their marine estates better. I've also been sharing experiences of how you go about understanding what activities are taking place or will take place. As I alluded to, I, I, I help the UK research vessels with their diplomatic clearances. And that process involves identifying or sharing that information with other countries. However, it's clear that not every country has a system in place to capture what is actually happening in your marine estates. Um, and I think it's important that people recognise this because there is millions of pounds worth of data have been acquired in your waters that you may not be uh, familiar with, but is readily available uh, for you to have access to. With regards to developing policy, um, I've been doing this at a national scale as part of the UK delegation at the BBNJ treaty negotiations. And for those of you less familiar with the BBNJ, uh, it has four components, the first being uh, the use and exploitation of marine genetic resources and the benefits that arise from the exploitation of MGR. The establishment of area-based management tools, including marine protected areas, the need to undertake environmental impact assessments and the delivery of capacity development initiatives. And all of these four areas are in the context of the BBNJ for areas beyond national jurisdiction. But of course, the skills that you required for those in areas beyond national jurisdiction are, of course, transferable to what you need within your territorial waters also. Um, at a regional scale, I'm a member of the European Marine Board, uh, which is a forum specifically designed to enable the development of evidence-based policies. Uh, and this is by way of influencing, for example, uh, the European Union's um, decisions on what they may fund uh, in the marine science space. And at the global level, uh, in my role as the alternate head of the UK delegation at the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO, uh, where I need to be mindful of marine policies to help develop initiatives in the context of the IOC that are best suited to deliver against current priority areas. So undertaking science for the betterment of knowledge has always and always will be a noble endeavour. However, use uh, and a need for scientific understanding is changing, or at least it is in the UK, and I think this is um, getting more common in other countries as well. In the past, doing science for science sake, driven by curiosity, was perfectly normal, and who knows where we would be where would it be if it wasn't for the greats such as Darwin and Newton, who explored natural phenomena with little understanding that the impact of their work would bring. And there is still a place for such blue sky science. 
However, in modern times, more and more science has been funded, and I think this is the important piece here, it's the funding to deliver impact and solutions. In which case scientists need to be more and more aware of what they are trying to solve and articulate far clearly, more clearly, what their efforts will address and what impact it will have. And often the case, this impact on society. More and more do we hear of a need for ocean literacy uh, and the need for society uh, to understand the importance of the ocean. Yet often is the case that our own scientists work in silos and don't necessarily appreciate or even care what their value, what the value of their work is. Excuse me a minute. Sorry about that, after the language. Uh, so where was I? Yes, more and more do we need to understand ocean literacy, but like I said, um, our own scientists work in silos. Uh, and so they don't necessarily appreciate or even understand what the value of their work is. Uh, so having a well-promoted policy helps scientists to develop, design and implement their research in a way that supports policies, bringing that societal benefit of their work. So if I look at the poll, I see we have a, a range of uh, agencies represented from uh, academia, government, consultancy and other, the, the majority coming from government, I see, um, but most of which are technical. There are some research and some policy and some management. So there's a nice uh, breadth of uh, experiences and capabilities this afternoon. But whether you're a scientist, uh, a decision maker or a diplomat, I think it's fair to say that we all have a role in ensuring that as a global collective, we pull together to try to reverse the current trend of declining ocean health. And I think developing robust policies, sharing their existence and intent more widely and having adequate resource and infrastructure is important to us all. So to that end, this afternoon's session is split into two parts. For the first 45 minutes or so, uh, I'll provide some thought piece for you to consider. I'm certainly not here to provide a guidebook as to how science can support the development and delivery of policy, uh, as this is often unique to each circumstance, but to share some thoughts and to encourage debate uh, amongst the participants. That then takes us into the second part of the session uh, where we already have three volunteers and I'm very grateful to them, um, uh, ready to share their experiences and again to allow for some knowledge exchange. So let's start with the first slide here. And what we have here is something that's been termed a horrendogram and it looks very busy. And um, what they're trying to capture is uh, an understanding of international law, European directives, and the way that nation states have been trying to implement these. And I think it reflects the complexities uh, which result in a patchwork of legislation, and that results in national legislation leading to piecemeal approach to marine protection. Fortunately, in Europe, uh, uh, this has now been recognized and from for EU, uh, from a EU perspective, uh, they have now progressed to a more uh, holistic directives. Um, you can try to uh, uh, visualize um, where you need policies in a sectoral way. Uh, and this is what these authors uh, from South Africa have tried to achieve with their horrendogram. Um, but what I would caution against is such compartmentalization. I think we can all appreciate that uh, an activity in one sector can very readily impact uh, another sector. For, so for example, if we take urban development and agriculture, if policies in this space were to be developed in absence of recognizing what impact they could have on the marine environment, well, you could argue then that that policy is failing because it's not taking that overarching or over, overlooking holistic perspective on what the implication of activities in one sector is on another. So in that case, it, we need to take a somewhat holistic overview of, of everything that we potentially or possibly can do. But in doing so, 
you might have something that looks a little like this, which looks like a complete mess. Um, now, admittedly, this is a, a computer output from statistical modeling uh, of planning and policy application. Um, but it does demonstrate that there's linkages all over the place. Uh, so that's why it's imperative to have an understanding of what a policy is trying to achieve. And we can do this by writing green papers and white papers and undertaking consultations. And what this is trying to do is try to avoid fragmentation. Uh, and this can be caused, of course, by local policies that don't take into account the higher level requirements. And these can be, and this could be achieved, this overarching holistic approach could be achieved by national ocean policies and strategies. And if you think of these uh, akin to marine spatial planning. So those of you who are familiar with marine spatial planning, it's a concept or a tool where you look at a particular ocean space, you look at all the activity in that space, and you try to manage the, the interacting demands on that ocean space through this marine spatial planning tool. Well, the national ocean policy is actually trying to achieve something very similar uh, in the sense that it's trying to understand what is the use of the ocean space or the marine space, recognizing all the different facets of that use and trying to bring it together into one overarching national policy that the individual sectors then can recognize and where they start to develop policies feed into that overarching policy. So if we go about developing a policy, there's a need to determine the motivation for that policy. What structures are there that can enable dialogue between scientists and legislators and how can that policy be delivered? So for a motivation perspective, we can in the first instance look at international and national obligations. What is it that's needed by a government to ensure that it delivers against treaties that they may have signed or obligations actually placed upon them uh, by states through intergovernmental frameworks such as the United Nations? I'm aware that uh, some in this session, or I'm aware that this session was prompted in part by some needing to better understand how ocean acidification data uh, should be submitted to address indicator 14.3.1 of SDG 14. Question is, uh, is there a need to have a national policy to ensure this happens? Given it's an obligation, uh, th through the SDGs, uh, at obligation on a state to do this, is there a need to have a policy to make sure that there's buying? If so, uh, wouldn't that part of that policy for SDG 14 be captured by broader SDG priorities? We all know that the SDGs, or 17 of them, have a number, over 100 indicators. Not all indicators will be relevant to all countries. So there is a question, can you develop a policy that identifies your particular interest in the SDGs to make sure that you deliver against those obligations? Or are there policies specifically developed to address SDG 14 as a standalone or even specific parts of SDG 14 that are particular relevance to a particular country's circumstance? Like I said, not all indicators are relevant to all countries. Many in SDG 14, however, are because most coastal states do have a vested interest in, in looking at those indicators and making sure that they do something to improve the situation. So a policy is in effect a principle or an aspiration. But in order to make sure that those aspirations are recognized, they need to be captured by a overarching framework, as I've previously alluded to. So to try to address a holistic approach, it's useful to have an overarching policy within which there are guiding principles that speak to the development of subordinate policies, for want of a better word. And what we can see here is an extract from the UK's Marine and Coastal Access Access Act of 2009, which in itself provides the overarching framework to manage marine 
functions and activities. This extract relates to marine planning in UK waters. And what it recognises is that there will be policies developed by the devolved administrations in the UK. So in the UK, England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland all take their respective responsibilities for their own waters. Um, so it's an important thing that each one of these developed administrations, when developing policies for marine planning, do so so that they are all addressing the overarching policy as provided by the Act. And just to emphasise the importance of having an overarching framework, what we see here is a schematic of government departments responsible for managing English waters only. Uh, so this excludes developed administrations and uh, international obligations. So what we see on the left uh, is the UK government and different uh, obligations or sources of different obligations. Uh, this is a fairly dated one, but of course we still have the European Union obligations here, the international obligations, uh, the different kinds of international obligations all feeding into the UK government, the devolved administrations, and then feeding down into the lower order into the government departments, the delivery agencies, and the specifics of what each one are trying to deliver. So you can start to understand how the marine space can be fairly complex and the need to better manage it in a, in, in a holistic uh, manner. So Mindful that a policy is an outline of an aspiration, here are some examples of policies for which frameworks have been developed to support the delivery. So if I'll just read a couple out here, so for Australia their ocean policy is to deliver a framework for integrated and ecosystem based planning and management for all Australia's marine jurisdictions. How this is delivered of course is delivered by lower level um, frameworks. Likewise, for Canadians' ocean strategy uh, to ensure healthy, safe and prosperous oceans for the benefit of current and future generations of Canadians. So again, very aspirational, doesn't actually talk at all to how the policy will be delivered. But if we look at the US policy here, or the language relating to the US policy statement, excuse me, their policy says, it's to improve decision making, so there's a recognition there that there is something going wrong. It's to promote effective coordination, and I think this is important and we'll get onto that in a minute. And the intent of improving the coordination for better decision making is to move towards an ecosystem based management approach. So the, the last few words there is what they're trying to achieve, but the first half of the sentence is recognizing how this needs to be achieved. So as you can see, the policies themselves, they're rather brief and succinct. But like I said, the mechanism that is then put in place to deliver can be quite complex. So I see at least two opportunities to provide signs into policy. The first being in the development of a policy. Um, so to help develop policies, it's useful to have a forum where policy and decision makers have access to experts who can speak uh, to particular issues. In the UK, we have something called the UK Marine Science Coordination Committee, which has a membership of UK governments, including the Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office, and the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. There is also devolved administration, so regional representation on the MSEC. Uh, there are government arm's length agencies, such as the Marine Management Organisation, the UK Hydrographic Office, the Met Office, and the Centre for Environment, Fisheries and Aquaculture Science, as well as representatives from the major marine research centres in the UK. And the National Oceanography Centre uh, is one of them, and where in fact we do provide the Secretariat for the MSEC. Uh, and in that way, we get to have a, a seat at the table to make sure that we, as a research organisation, are fully conversant with what's happening at the higher level within government with regards to their policy development. So you can start to appreciate that the MSEC provides a forum for a diverse range of expertise and interests. 
And I'm also aware that Granada are, for example, progressing in this space as well, where there's an ocean governance committee that is being formalized with cabinet approval. And that committee will have oversight of the development of the policy. And that committee can then report back to the cabinet for sign off. Um, we would have heard more on this uh, from a participant from Granada. However, unfortunately, in the last couple of days, uh, he was uh, conflicted with some work related issues. Um, but if you want to understand more of what's happening in Granada, I can uh, certainly provide you with details uh, of that individual. And whilst the establishment of committees has clear benefits, it's not always the case that they've been taken advantage of. Uh, I'm sure we're all familiar with government and their willingness to develop policies in absence of any consultation. Uh, but there is no doubt that by taking into account government priorities alongside a more pragmatic approach maybe by the technocrats will result in more robust informed uh, based policy making and the decisions around those policies there are ample examples where governments have decided on a policy only then to be criticized for its delivery resulting in the perception of a bad policy, which may sometimes be accurate, but often the case may not be. And that then opens up the criticism on the policy itself uh, and its application. And these two issues could be addressed uh, where there is broad stakeholder inputs to make sure that the, the development and the implementation of policies uh, are carried out uh, efficiently. And I'll use this uh, one example. So if we take uh, the example of a policy to protect 30% of the ocean by 2030, uh, so 30 by 30 for some who may have heard about it. Uh, this is something that's been uh, spearheaded by the UK government, um, which now has the backing of 41 countries. And um, Belize and St. Kitts and Nevis, uh, two from the region, have uh, 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 bought in to, to this initiative. And it's an absolutely wonderful ambition. But the reality is protecting 30% of, of a nation's waters, your national waters, doesn't come anywhere close to protecting 30% of the world's oceans. In fact, it would require protecting close to 80% of national waters to fulfill this particular ambition. And that's something that's highly unlikely, especially given that until recently, most countries couldn't even achieve the 10% included in the HE targets. So in order to achieve this ambition, it will require the tre uh, a treaty to enable the establishment of MPAs in areas beyond national jurisdiction. So the aforementioned BBNJ. That treaty is, is nowhere near from being decided. So the question is, is this a bad policy? given at the time it was being agreed, it was, it was unlikely that it could be achieved in absence of a new treaty, or is the policy aspiration in itself adequate to bring about change? So that, that's something for, for you to consider. So to help avoid any uncertainty, having identified the overarching requirements, how then is it best to put in place a framework to deliver on an agreed policy? And herein lies the fine detail which are best addressed by way of broader stakeholder consultation uh, and engagement. In effect, heading off at the pass many of the unknowns and uncertainties with regard to the successful delivery of a policy and ensuring that there is a clearly identified outcomes and a framework to deliver on that policy. And all of these things can be achieved with that broader consultation. Once a policy has been identified with clear outcomes and objectives, it should then have some form of approval just to ensure that it has the full weight of the relevant responsible agencies to buy into it. And on the slide here, I list some of the components that need to be considered such as needing to have government weight behind a policy, which would require cabinet sign off. You need to establish the committees to enable that dialogue. And by having these two, it makes accessing to funding that much more easier, relatively speaking. You also need to be mindful of what research and technology is required. 
and what indicators should be established to demonstrate the success of that policy or failure of that policy. And then to ensure that society, that well, to ensure a societal buy-in into a policy by way, by way of promoting the values of that policy to society. After all, it is the electorate that decision makers often listen to. So having established the policy and developed a framework for its delivery, there is a need to ensure that the resource and infrastructure is in place. These, of course, vary from country to country. Ideally, an ability to deliver a policy should be aligned with the capabilities in the country. But this isn't always possible. And as I alluded to earlier, there are certain obligations placed on a state that were agreed as a part of a wider forum, such as the UN. So delivery of those may be more difficult compared to policies developed with a national interest, where the government is more likely to invest in ensuring in its delivery. It's important that all capabilities are explored, uh, whether in government or wider by way of a society, a civil society or academia, or through learned societies or institutes that focus in thematic areas in particular. So this brings us to the second stage for science into policy, which is the implementation of that policy, where scientists do their work in support of a policy and policy makers are kept up to date with the delivery of the policy objectives. And this could be enabled by way of dialogue via the forums I previously mentioned, which could result in developing new policies or changing a policy as things progress or where things are clearly not achievable. Um, this also offers an opportunity to discuss resource where resource is lacking, uh, leading to recognizing the capacity development needs of a country. So 12 days ago, uh, the first session of this workshop was opened with a presentation on the UN Decade for Ocean Science for Sustainable Development where the various facets of the ocean decade were shared and in no small part providing a framework that we can all buy into and coalesce around in order to deliver the science requirements needed to reverse the decline in ocean health. This is the whole mantra of the decade. It is something that as a global community, we need to come together to address. That's not to say that we all have to be doing the same thing. So the question to ask yourselves, are the components of the decade that can be used to focus your respective institutional, but maybe more significantly national needs into priorities that can be developed with an agreed approach to its delivery. And that way adding to the principle of strength in numbers. If we do our bit, they do their bit. Eventually our combined efforts will result in a significant impact on a global scale. Have the SDGs been used in your respective countries to motivate a similar approach to recognize which SDGs are of critical importance to your, your respective circumstances and have there been policies put in place to ensure the delivery of those uh, SDGs? Or would these be better addressed on a regional basis? So I'm just gonna use a, a, a final slide here to uh, share with you some um, experiences from the region, uh, in particular for those of you who may not be that familiar. So uh, the organization of the Eastern Caribbean States, the OECS, uh, in partnership with the Commonwealth Secretariat developed the Eastern Caribbean Ocean Policy, the ECROP. Now, this was motivated by a recognition that there was a fragmented planning going on in the region. This would have been probably not only country to country, but also within those countries, that there was no cohesion in the way that use of the marine space was being managed. The result was one overarching policy document. And in that document, it provided a framework for enhanced coordination which is wonderful, but also a template to develop national ocean or marine policies, including marine spatial plans. The recognition of the ECROP resulted in the World Bank recognizing a responsible approach, what a responsible approach this was in the region. And the World Bank 
opened up funding and that resulted in the Caribbean Regional Oceanscape Project, the CROP. Uh, and we have David Robin online, uh, I saw earlier, and I'm hoping that David will speak more to this in the second uh, part of the second session. Um, one of the results of the crop so far is, is the development or in, in development five national ocean policies um, by Dominica, Grenada, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And as I alluded to earlier on, it's a shame that our friend from Grenada can't be with us um, because he would have spoken to how that this process has resulted in a national ocean policy uh, which is very close to sign off by their government. So whereas the regional framework as set out in the ECROP provided the direction, the national ocean policies set out a means to operationalize the direction into national decision-making uh, and to achieve a transition to a more integrated governance approach. And I think we could all agree that um, ensuring that things are done when, when in particular countries are in such close proximity, ensuring that things are done in a relatively similar manner it is no bad thing. So I'm going to stop talking there and I'll just open uh, the next five minutes or so uh, to any questions and answers should there be any. So thank you very much.